the, the fourth session in the Do It Yourself and Community Act Guiding Screening Symposium, which is the very first day, the very first time in the entire day, the screening some sessions at a meeting, so it's the public. Um, uh, we're about to go to the DIY and text session, which you've got these like amazing women here to talk to you today about what they've learned. And um, I just wanted to mention that in addition to this great, this uh, incredible team, Natalie Codronell has also began a, a really important application. There's information on the back table about it. It's called uh, Open Archive, and it's an application that helps you deliver <coughs> mobile materials directly to an internet archive. So be sure to talk to her about it and check out the materials on the table. And without further ado, long time.
It's always a struggle for me to believe I'm capable of mastering these types of skills, and so I've always had to go away along the way to believe that I can actually learn tech skills, um, which is why, like many humanities rooted non white men, I have some unresolved stuff about that. And that's partly why, um, however much I value my ability to write a little bash or navigate the directories in my Linux server or whatever, the most important tech tool in my toolbox is still just basic conversation. Um, talking to other folks, sharing skills, exchanging stories, reading and writing the docs, cheering each other on. And I just want to give three quick examples of just exactly what I mean and how I have found conversation to be a really important tech tool for you. So first, as I mentioned, I'm a member of Transfer Collective. As Carmel Curtis um, mentioned in her plenary talk yesterday, <coughs> Transfer is an organization that provides low-cost analog to digital transfer services for small arts and activist organizations. Um, we also offer trainings and consultancies um, for small organizations struggling to manage foreign digital materials. I mean, that's what we do, that's our mission. But there's another less public service um, that the organization provides, which is that we serve as a hub for emerging archivists to learn new skills. Um, we use what I like to call an intersectionally feminist horizontal mentorship model where we all learn from each other in an ongoing, non-hierarchical, non-judgmental, structured way. At our weekly meetings, on retreats, through research, on our Slack channel, and during dedicated skill, ch skill shares, we teach each other about video digitization equipment, quality control workflows, FFmpeg commands, rsync, and other topics. Without this kind of horizontal mentorship, I would be a much less competent professional, not to mention a much lonelier human. And this is the part I don't want live stream deep on, if you don't mind. And please don't tweet this section, it's a little bit. Um, and then third, I just want to mention a project I've been working on in collaboration with a few other community-based archivists, including Caroline Rubens of Apple Shop, who may be in the room right now, which is a set of knowledge-sharing resources for um, users of the Collective Access digital collection software. Um, although Collective Access is technically open source software, the user community hasn't really functioned like an open source user community to date, and we all suffer as a result. So I've worked with a whole bunch of other collective access users over the past couple of years to establish networks for horizontally to communicate with other users. And recently we launched a landing portal on the web where you can share user-generated documentation and workflows and stories. It's at collectiveaccesscommunity.org if you're interested. This kind of exchange has been also invaluable to my ability to modify and deploy my institution's instance of this digital collections platform. And sidebar, I'm hosting a meetup for collective access users who are interested people, um, people who are interested in collective access tomorrow at noon, and I think it's in the sky room, and you're all invited to come, even if you don't know anything about that platform, we're going to just talk about different ways of helping out each other. So what do these three things have in common? They're purposeful communities created with the express purpose of developing a supportive, feminist, non-hierarchical, uh, knowledge-sharing community. It's true that there are already existing tech conversation communities on the web, but research suggests that it's complicated for women, people of color, queers, and other marginalized folks to participate in a lot of these communities. I don't have time to discuss all the research, but you can go read about it. There are some citations. Um, I'll just note that Philip Guo has um, conducted a study that um, revealed that women participate in much lower. <coughs> there are women on Stack Overflow forums are there in like in 20% of all users are women, but only 5% of commenters are women or, or question askers are women there. And then uh, James William III and Jolanda um, Pieta von Arnhem, likewise found that librarians of color um, often, quote, want and need someone who they feel is approachable with whom they can identify to ask questions on their <coughs> And so in short, I just want to say, you know, like, there are already existing communities like this, but I think um, it's good for us to think about how we can support or you know, um, at least understand and appreciate that these communities exist and that we um, have, a, that we continue to support a wide range of curated, supportive, intentional communities that can support conversations about tech. <coughs>
Hello. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I'm really happy to be um, speaking on this totally, totally free panel. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a command line tool that I started using, a uh, command line program I started using that kind of developed into a web friendly, accessible tool. Uh, and just before I start talking about that, I just want to preface this by saying that it's a very worrisome time and a very worrisome day. Uh, and I think just uh, this talk will be very technical. It's something I can actually wrap my mind around right now. So we can all just be hopefully comforted in the strangeness of the command line for this <laughs> abstract <laughs> world for a couple of minutes. So thanks for coming along with me. And uh, yeah, I feel very worried, but I don't feel lonely with all of you guys out here. I know that we've all They'll have similar reasons for being here and choosing their profession. So let's do this. <laughs> okay, so I had this problem uh, at work where I managed data on three different servers. These are production servers, and producers were adding quite a bit of data to them constantly from 500 terabytes each to maybe one or two terabytes per month. And so I had to circulate that data, figure out what was necessary on those servers for production, and figure out what wasn't circulate uh, data offline in ways that I won't go into now. Um, and so I had to know how much data was on each server and what was changing over time, kind of keep track of uh, what was what was being added mostly, but also what was moving. So the only thing I knew uh, kind of this job <coughs> that I know at Human Rights Watch was uh, to use this command called disk usage to track how much data is being taken up by uh, certain, in this case, just folders. Um, and the command line output uh, looks just like this uh, for, the, for the command gigabytes on the left side here and the projects uh, naming and arrangement standards on the right. And the command that I used uh, is du. It comes by default with Linux-based operating systems, including Mac OS X, and has a couple of options, uh, uh, which would be <coughs> SCH. And then after that, I would just add the name of the folder or the volume that I wanted to read. So that's really straightforward, just to break it down really quickly. Du, disk usage, the program I'm running. Uh, the flag S is used to ask for one entry per file. Um, dash C, to make a grand total at the end, if I'm dropping in like several folders, if I'm using, I'm asking for several folders. Oh, and I will tweet this presentation. <laughs> and, uh, and then dash h is asking the program to please give me output in human readable units. Uh, so in like megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, uh, things that I can relate to as a human. <laughs> uh, and then this asterisk at the very end of the designated folder that I'd like to look at just says show me all the files and folders within that folder. All good? Nodding? Really yeah. cool. okay, great. Pretty simple. I like it a lot. So I knew this. I'm like a dog. Like, I know my, I know I'm gonna sit and lie down and roll over. So I'll just like do those things repeatedly to get treats. This <laughs> works. <laughs> <laughs> like I do this, and my treats come out. Right. Like, like, you know, this comes out. Like, my treat. <laughs> Boom. There it is. My command line output. Pretty simple. That's just on the little shuttle sh sh graph that I'm using. Um, and I hope to have time to just run through a really quick demo on this. Uh, there's my grand total at the very bottom. Uh, again, the, oh, and then, okay, then I had this other thing, right? Okay, so I figured out that if I wanted to take that command line output from the terminal and send it anywhere other than, you know, like, just, it would only move the terminal unless I, I uh, output those files to, like, or, sorry, the command line output to, like, a text file somewhere. So I just dump the command line text file, or, excuse me, I would dump the output from this command into a text file onto the desktop. So there I have it. It's a report now, a tangible text file with that information. All right, that's what it looks like. Uh, and the little arrow for a standard output, it's like that designation, pretty simple. So now my output is a text file. Okay, sorry, it took me a long time to get there. There it is. Um, and then I realized, okay, great, I have a text file. That's readable uh, in a web browser, like HTTP can render a text file and you can see it. I could use this uh, text file and uh, drop it into a designated folder within Mac OS X. That's the, the folder that's used as kind of like the rally point for uh, 
ping a web server, uh, and I'll show you where that is. Um, basically, if you just turn Apache on, on your computer, uh, your own net, if your computer is networked, and you drop a text file into this designated folder, you can uh, make a query in a browser, or a file, and boom, it pops up anywhere on your network. Uh, so I run this command to start Apache, just another kind of like dog like command, just enter it into the terminal, boom, Apache starts, cool. Here's the designated folder uh, in Mac OS X. If you'd like to host a web page from your computer, just library, web server, documents, have a report on my computer, use it all the time for all kinds of command line reports. So again, this is kind of just like a little journey where I'm like, okay, here's some ways that I could uh, sort of manipulate this technology that I know how to use um, to create this tool. And it could be used for any kind of you know, command line reporting. There it is, the folder. And there's my output. Output.txt just dropped into the folder. Does that make sense? Everyone's cool, nodding, everyone seems to look good. Okay. <laughs> so there it is, hosted in a web browser. My computer's name is Arcturus. Uh, so if I write in Arcturus.local into my browser, on any computer on our network, my text file appears. Um, I would have to do like Arcturus.local forward slash output.txt, you know, name the file itself. And that's it. Uh, I have this tool. Um, so this is for this is what it looks like the, the tool that I'm using at work. Um, that's the way it looks for all three servers. And so I use this. Um, you can set up a, a daily job that runs you know, once in the evening uh, to make this output. And that's it. And I'll just do it really quickly. Command line while we're all here. that I've been using lately. Um, if, you, if you want to do demonstrations for people, uh, it's great. It's called Keycaster. It's an open source program. And when you type, it just uh, loads. Okay, cool. Yeah. The letters that you type show up on the screen. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. You just made it worth it, Nicole. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I put this one in my pocket. <laughs> okay, so disk usage do you dash S E H. I'm gonna type in this little shell drive. So in Mac, this is under uh, volumes. This is a little USB drive that I plugged into my computer. And if you hit tab, it like opens. Oh, wait, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just see what's in here first. I'm going to hit a tab that's going to tell me which uh, devices are connected to my computer right now. Right? <laughs> okay, it doesn't look like it's showing up because the person. 
understand about this?
sit down and my boss, Dave Rice, was like, oh, just like try and read this and like tell me what you think it's doing. And so by learning how to read it, I sort of was able to see what was possible to do with the language. And so um, that was sort of like really helpful. So I'm hoping that maybe by like us breaking down this script and going through, it might be helpful for you too to see like what, what Bash does. Um, and so I just want to start off quickly by talking a little bit about this concept of microservices. Um, this gift has no meaning. It's just very, it's really relaxing. <laughs> and I think we could all like use a little bit of relaxation. Um, so, uh, so microservices are sort of this like really fundamental um, to how I approach using technology and scripting. Um, and so microservices are this idea that sort of break down extensive multi-step processes within um, sort of like software and digital preservation workflows into just like these distinct like chunks and pieces. Um, and so there's um, this blog post that has a really useful um, definition where it compares it to like the opposite, which is a monolithic application, um, where a monolithic app is one big program with many responsibilities, whereas microservices-based apps uh, are composed of several small programs, each with a single responsibility. Um, and so I think like, you know, a micro, an example of a microservice is just sort of like one thing that you want to do. It's like, I just want to create technical metadata for this file. Or like, I just want to transcode access copies for all of these files. And so if you can kind of like think and sort of break apart these workflows into distinct pieces, they're, you, they're more like manageable, but then you can also build upon them and sort of like grow into something bigger depending on your skill and like what you are able to learn. Um, so. Uh, writing a script, um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the time, um, oh, whoops, no, no spoilers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the time people don't sit down and write the perfect script right away. Um, it's more like that you write something and then it like doesn't work and then you like try and make it work and then it doesn't work and then you write something new because it does work and then um, you know you just like go on in that process. It's iterative, so you're sort of like constantly going through it. Um, and one thing that I like to do when I'm writing out a script is to start by making a list of everything that I want the script to do. So I say like what is what are all the processes that need to happen when I'm writing the script. Um, so for the script that I'm going to demo, um, I think I'll just bring it up now. So. Right? So we're going to start with a while loop at the very 
very beginning. So if we look up here to the first um, part there, we have this well, there is not nothing do. And so then we're going to do everything that's within this while wow loop. And then at the very bottom here, we have a done. We have a done. So while there's something there, you should perform all these actions on it. And then when you're done, like go back to the top and see if there's more stuff. And if there is another file, do that. Um, and it's like, I'm here, I use a computer all the time. How does this computer like? <laughs> um, Okay, cool. And so then, um, so we're going to start with that while loop, and then, um, you know, it's going to look for these inputs and then process them as it goes through. Um, the next thing we're going to do is set up some variables and make the directories that we'll be moving files into so that um, all the things that we create have a place to go. Um, and so a variable is sort of like a placeholder where you set it um, equal to something, like a particular value. Um, and then instead of using that whole like string of characters or whatever it is, you can just use that variable. So here we're setting the media ID to be the file name of the input file without the file extension. So we're doing that by taking the base name of the input. Base name's cool, like open up your terminal and type base name and then drag in like a file and see what happens. It's fun. Um, and so, but basically it's like it's taking the file name and then cut dash D period is um, cutting it at the delimiter. Um, and so that way we don't have like a weird file extension in our package name. Um, and then, oh, an important part of the while loop is the shift, because that shifts it through like this whole process. Um, and so, um, and then we're going to set up the directories that we um, will put these files into. So we begin by setting up the overarching like package directory on the desktop, and then we use that package variable to set up the rest of the subdirectories. Um, so, you can see that each thing is like equal, and we're using the make directory um, for each one. Um, and then um, we're going to move on to the transcoding of the access copy using ffmpeg. So the ffmpeg command structure is to call the program, um, we set the output first of all, and you'll see that we append the access. Um, so we, um, the structure of the ffmpeg command is to do ffmpeg, which calls that program dash i, which is the input, and then all of the different flags that you need for um, the, to create that particular copy. And for this, I just, um, I think I copied uh, like an H.264 file stuff from FF Improviser, which is a great resource for using FFmpeg um, if you don't want to wade through a ton of documentation. Um, and so then once we've created our access copy, we'll make the metadata for each of the video files and distinguish between them through their file names. And um, then and we'll sort of like, so we're creating the metadata on, this, on one side over here, and then we're going to pipe it using that little um, pipe symbol into an XML format and then write that out to a document. So we have these two documents, and we're doing it in XML because that is a structured data format that we'll be able to <coughs> potentially parse later if we like remove these documents. We want to input this information into some other system. Um, and so um, that's what we do. And then, um, Um, so then we'll move like the original like master video file um, and access copy into the video files directory um, and then we'll CD into that directory so we move into that directory and create um, checksums for both of the video files um, and this md 5 deep um, creates this like really kind of useful digital forensics metadata to like what computer you're on um, and like what time and everything like that in addition to creating checksums. Um, and then we'll notify the user um, through this echo statement that the processing of the package is complete and that like it's moving on to the next one. So if you're running this script in your terminal, you can kind of like look through and see like what's been done and what's finished. And it's sort of like it's just a way to notify what's happening because you won't actually see any of this when you're running it in the command line. Um, and then we'll be done and then we can you know start over if there's more files. Um, and I also um, would just say too like I there's lots of um, comments in here and so the comments are sort of meant to be like explaining what each part does and it's really helpful if you're writing code or <coughs> contributing to another repository um, you want to share what you have to have really good comments so that the person who's reading your code can understand like what you're doing um, and like what your intention was behind writing that particular line um, so you know we try and have like good sort of like comments that are helpful to uh, somebody who might be interpreting what you're, um, what you have there. And so then, um, I can 
show you this <coughs> demo. I don't know if it like, um, yeah, so so I type in the script name in, that was really, really way too fast, but you type in the script name and then you drag in the file that you want to input, right? And so this is FFmpeg doing its thing and it's going to do this for a while, so I like, it's boring to watch, so I stopped it. Um, but it's going to um, create a visual aids, and so that's the video that I dragged in this transfer collective video of ETDubs. Um, shameless plug, you can watch it on Internet Archive. Um, so I dragged in that video file, and so the package name is created visual aids 03. Oh, here you can watch it again. Um, and then um, it had, you can see that there's two sort of directories, the video files and the metadata files, and then within those, there's the two um, videos and the two metadata files, um, and the checksum.md5 is also in the metadata. And um, yes. So that's, that's what it looks like. Um, so yeah, I don't know, like maybe this is helpful or maybe it's not, but the idea is more that like you can, you can sort of build upon um, like little pieces bit by bit and create something that might be useful for you and that it's totally possible to do and, um, and yeah, I just, um, I don't know, try, you should try it, it's, it's fun, um, it's cool. <laughs> so. Thanks, okay. I just looking at the directory, 
Um, and it wasn't, we didn't want to rearrange our whole file structure based on these technical specifications. It's much more useful for us to arrange the files by partner because we work with so many partners. Um, so we didn't end up adding MVP to our workflow, but exploring it as an option gave us the idea that we might be able to create a script to automatically check our technical specs. So we asked our colleague Dave Price if he could write a script for us. Um, I ended up managing this project, I think, primarily because I had the most interest in using scripts and similar tools, but not because I had any uh, prior skills in this area. Um, but working with Dave and testing and providing feedback allowed me to get familiar with a few basic technology tools, um, which have improved my confidence and interest in using and sharing these tools and in investigating other ways that we might automate parts of our workflow. So first up is GitHub. When Dave started creating scripts for us, he suggested we set up an organizational GitHub account for CADPP. And on GitHub, we can store all the code and scripts related to the project. Um, and our code is open and available for others to use. Um, it also allows us to collaborate with developers by making it easy to report and track issues. And these issues can be assigned to certain people. Um, so on this slide, there's a history of issues reported for this repository. And they've all been marked as closed since they've been resolved. GitHub also tracks changes and prompts the editor to provide a description of the changes made so the modification is clear even if you don't read code. So in this example, the change was to do bitrate checks on streams instead of container. And with this particular script, which mainly just checks the technical specs, um, it's fairly easy to see what is going on in the script, plus Dino mentioned um, comments, which Dave used, and that really helped me to see like what was going on in the script. Um, so I was eventually able to edit the script myself directly on GitHub, and in testing the script with our files, I might see something wasn't being checked, or was checking for the wrong metric, so I could go in and make that change. Um, in this example, I added a line to check that the sample rate of the audio access files is for 4.1 kilohertz, and I adjusted the streaming bit rate that the script is looking for. And I'm mentioning this to let you know that the script is available on GitHub. You can fork it to your own GitHub account and modify the technical specs to check for your own files. Dave also asked us to download Homebrew, which is used to install and update the script by pulling the current version from GitHub. And I found Homebrew to be very user friendly. This is the homepage of their website. And at the very top, it tells you to copy and paste this text into Terminal to install Homebrew. <laughs> and I now, know, I now know the basic install and update commands. Um, of course, in the process of trying to get the script installed on all the computers in the office, I encountered errors. So over time, I've learned some very basic troubleshooting skills from sending errors to Dave and seeing his responses. Um, but Homebrew is also pretty helpful in this regard. There's a brew doctor command, which checks and reports <coughs> if anything seems wrong. And the error messages also often include command, suggested commands that might help the problem. So I'll often just type whatever it tells me it thinks I should type, and that often fixes things. And last time I mentioned the shell, which is available on Macs through Terminal. I use the shell to run, I use the command line to run other scripts, but I hadn't used many shell commands before. But and using this script and others, I started to learn the syntax, um, which I found usually takes the form of the basic command or calling the script, and then modifiers preceded by the dash, and then the path to target files or folders. So for this script, um, we have the name of the script, then the dash s allows us to select one of the four profiles, and the dash v selects 
verbose mode, which displays everything that was done. Um, in this case, check the verbose effects, check the end here values. And one helpful thing to know is that typing the name of the command will show available options. So here, I've typed verify media, and it shows the available modifiers. And I found Shell is like a really powerful tool for finding and moving and copying files, among other things. So uh, recently, I've learned that I can use it to find all of our access and PD4 files on a drive and move them to an upload folder where they all need to be together for us to use the Internet Archive upload script, um, which this sounds like a really small thing, but it's going to save us tons of time. It's way faster than going through the finder and like manually moving 100 files.
um, these are some good resources for you to use. That's sort of it for me. Yeah. yeah, so um, Library Freedom Project is a relatively new organization and they actually come out and do training. So you can get in touch with them and do workshops. Um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, that website has a bunch of different tools and tutorials for you to check out. And we also have a Google Doc that's shared. So you can go to this Google Doc if you have any information security kind of resources that you want to share with the community. Um, we really, you know, kind of encourage that. Uh, and uh, the, the bit.ly is listed right here. Um, so we wanted to encourage questions because I know this is a pretty technical panel. So if anyone has any questions, please let us know. <laughs> what is now? Lauren. Yes. Hi. Hi, I had a comment. Um, I just wanted to mention I'm going to be talking about Open Archive tomorrow, which is the Internet Archive's first mobile application that I had built, and it also goes over Orbot, which is Tor for mobile, and so security is a huge part of my project as well. What time? These are sister projects that are awesome. It's at 2 o'clock in the Hope Room, okay. and uh, like half my presentation will be about the threat model for archivists and the communities they serve, and dealing with the privacy issues that we've been made aware of thanks to uh, the others noted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Yes, in the back. Um, I did want to ask, um, this is your uh, uh, handle. Um, can you speak? I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, the media info code that you're, that you're showing me, you know, supply text, um, is that available in some form? Yes. Uh, 